Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm delighted today to welcome Diego Perez back to the Meta Hour podcast for a second time. Diego is a meditator, writer, and speaker, widely known by his pen name, Young Pueblo. Diego's practice of Vipassana meditation, as taught by S.N. Goenka, has given him a deeper understanding of liberation and inspires him to reach hundreds of thousands of people online every month through his writing. He is the author of several books including Clarity and Connection, which was just released in April 2021, instantly becoming a New York Times bestseller. Clarity and Connection is a collection of poetry and short prose that focuses on understanding how past wounds can impact our present relationships and is a wonderful resource for those invested in personal transformation and deepening their connection with others. Welcome back to the Meta Hour, Diego. Thank you so much for having me, Sharon. It's always such an honor to be uh, speaking with you and just be in contact. Well, thank you. It's such a a great delight. And really, congratulations on your new book. Thank Um, you. I was reading the Amazon reviews, which you may not. I don't. (laughs) It's really smart. I don't read my own either. But I was reading yours. And of course, they're all wonderful. And somebody made a comment about the tactile sense of the cover. Mm. So I've been just like rubbing the cover because <laughs> they were right. It's like really smooth and different. Yeah. Book covers, so. Yeah. It's interesting the way um, they're just like such different styles of books, depending on whether you're doing a poetry book or a nonfiction book. And um, yeah, what they do with paperbacks these days are pretty cool. I thought it was great. It's like a full sensory experience, you know, like every sense <laughs> where can be delighted. So what's it been like bringing it into the world just sort of almost mid pandemic or, you know, hopefully close yeah. to the end. But. Yeah. It's, um, it's been great. It, it was released, um, April 27th and it's just been, um, pretty wonderful and kind of like, um, eye opening how well it's been received. You know, it's, um, I don't really have a good sense of how I'm affecting people. Like, you know, I'm, I spend a lot of time, you know, sharing things online, writing things. And, you know, I share things on my account on Instagram and on my Substack, on my newsletter. But then when it comes time for when you're actually releasing a book and you see how many people, you know, pre-order and are supporting your book and, you know, giving you shout outs and telling you how much you're enjoying it. It's, it's a moment where you can really see um, the amount of impact and, and it's been pretty uh pretty amazing pretty and surprising too to be honest that's beautiful i saw a note um that the book can either be read on its own or as a companion to your first book called inward do you see them as fitting together yeah definitely i mean this 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 book is really the sequel um to inward and it's pretty intentional you know the the first one was designed um for the individual um for people to really try to build a new kind of like framework to see themselves in as they start growing and that first book especially is really designed for people who are not meditators for people who've never taken therapy before but they have started realizing that they would actually benefit from some type of introspection and clarity and connection is sort of what happens after that you know after you start getting to know yourself after you start loving yourself um, how does that then you know, not only change your perspective, but how does it impact your your relationships uh, with other people? And um, I think for a lot of us, you know, once we start meditating or once we start therapy, um, we come out with a lot more clarity and our connections pretty naturally get deeper. I'm so curious about your process in writing this. Like I remember when my first book, which was Loving Kindness, came out and that took me a really long time. It was really the product of years and years and years of practice and teaching and and so on. And then I was talking to a writer friend who who was like a little bit challenging. And he said to me, 
what happens when your first book is expresses your life's work? Oh. How do you write another book? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought a moment and I said, I guess you go deeper. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, which is sort of what happened, although I had a few detours along the way, you know, yeah. uh, in that I really decided, I kept looking like what's actually deeper for me than love or loving kindness. And I came up with faith, you know, and, and so that was really the genesis of that book. So I'm wondering if, if you relate to any of that. Yeah, that's a great, um, great question. I th- I feel like, um, especially with Inward, the first one, it did feel like a culmination of like a big period of my life where mm-hmm. I was like just getting started, just started, you know, I think it was in the middle of writing that book when I even started meditating daily. Um, and now sort of like shifting over into clarity and connection, it's making me kind of take a big step back so I can look at my trajectory as a writer and kind of just start dotting out like what are these different topics that I really want to hunker down in and and really explore from different perspectives um, and kind of deciding in myself that I think one of my one of my goals is to just um, to not write too many books um, to try mm-hmm. to just take my time and I'm a big big proponent of slow productivity um, cause that, you know, like an inward is a tiny book, but it took me like three years to write and mm-hmm. clarity and connection is also, you know, it's, it's, um, it has more words and longer pieces than inward, but it also took about like two and a half years to write. Um, but I think I want to just kind of put a lot of, you know, what I'm understanding into the different works that I'm creating, but also not set myself up in a situation where I'm like, you know, like putting out more material than I need to so that I don't um, kind of like over exhaust what I'm mm-hmm. understanding or having to just say the same thing over and over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm trying to be like really careful, but we'll see how that plays out. And when the topics come, they come. Um, but it's so far, you know, it feels good to have like two books out in I think like six or seven years time. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also the world is changing, you know, and sometimes it feels like the metabolism of the world is changing in a quicker and quicker way. Oh, and yeah. So there would be other compelling forces. Like this feels, as an example, like such a potent time to be exploring the world of relationships because, you know, here we are. Not everyone has had the same year, you know, mm-hmm. that we're coming mm-hmm. out of by any means. But I, for one, have lived an extremely quiet life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> where, like The last time I had lunch with somebody was March 9th, 2020. Wow. And I've had the occasional meal with Joseph Goldstein, who lives in the other half of this duplex, and very occasionally, maybe four or five times with other people as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then, you know, Joseph was really my pod, and then he went into a three-month retreat <laughs> of his own, you know. Oh, so, you know, and now I'm, uh, you know, vaccinated and about to uh, eventually go to New York City and but I have a friend um, who's uh, older. He's 86 years old. He's been in New York this whole time. So he's kind of lived through, you know, many twists and turns, like not leaving his apartment and then going out and being outside and, and all these different things. So he keeps suggesting things to me like, oh, when you're back, we can, you know, we can go to the theater. We can, and I just like <laughs> stare at the screen apparently with a very funny look on my face. He finally said to me, you're like someone leaving a submarine. <laughs> and I, I think I'm not the only one. And so what an incredible time to really be looking at the nature of relationships and what really matters to us. Yeah, it feels like a such a big transitionary moment for all of us. And I feel like the the main thing now I, for, for myself when I'm going out there is like, what is my intention with these connections that I have available to me? Like, how am I going to like try to reshape my thinking around friendships so that I'm, you know, like not as, um, I feel like it was just so easy before the pandemic to take everything for granted. And now when I get to see friends that I haven't seen in a year and a half, it's like, okay, like let's just go deep. Like let's, you know, let's spend a really enjoyable time together and not just think like, oh, I'm going to see you again next week or two weeks from now. But um, I always think that, you know, because we're going out 
into the world pretty slowly into this, you know, like um, post vaccine world, it's, I, I just feel like it's so important to, especially if you did have a really introspective and pretty transformative uh, pandemic period, you know, where you spend it primarily alone, like make sure that you maintain all of the techniques and skills that you've picked up over time and you don't lose them into like, you know, when you go back out into the wilds of like community and, and just yeah. open space, you know? So if you picked up a meditation technique, like keep using it. If you have a good relationship with your therapist, like keep feeding that, like keep, you know, just do your journaling, do whatever it is that you need to do to be able to show up as the best version of yourself, because that work at the end of the day is going to be like the foundation of your well-being. Without that, like your connections will suffer and things will become much more complicated. It's really true. It's like even the word resilience, which usually is taken to mean like bouncing back. It, it often feels like the suggestion is bouncing back to exactly the way things were before. Yeah. And, and that's like healing, you know, but really, of course, it's not. Oh, that's interesting to bring up too. I've been thinking about that concept of healing of like, um, you know, going back to the original state and, um, and it's so, you know, I've been, it doesn't quite fit with what I've been experiencing through meditating because who, you know, who I was back then is gone. Like that, that person is gone, you know, on the, on the mental level, the physical level, the atomic level, biological level, it's just changes happening so rapidly that, okay, when trauma occurs, when hurt occurs, when there are very strong emotions, of course, imprints are being lefted, left in the subconscious of the mind that will affect your like present and future behavior. But fundamentally, like, is does that you still exist? Like, no, not really. But it's better to just focus on turning your attention to trying to unbind those patterns and all of that kind of weight that you're like carrying in a very recurring manner and once you release mm -hmm. that, you get to be whoever you want to be now and, you know, just bring that new sort of presence and that new like love and openness to connection to who you are now, who you want to be later, as opposed to trying to recreate the past. Because in the past, like there's limitations there and in the present, it's just, there's just so much more possibility. I think that's such a usually important message to get out because I do hear of course, the word resilience has been used for a while now, um, and is almost a cliche. But now, you know, it's it's so so out there, and it so often does mean let's let's go back to the way it was before. Right. But we're close to even getting back to exactly the way it was before. Isn't that great? And you think, well, maybe not so great. You know, actually, it's like now let's build, let's do something better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's set ourselves up for real happiness and not just like go back to you know, going through the motions. Yeah, exactly. And there have been, you know, it's been such a hard time for so many people and uh, lots of lessons learned, I hope. And just as you say, you know, like, it's interesting when you mentioned journaling, you know, because I, I know so many people who've uh, really pursued that mm -hmm. in this time, and it's been really helpful. I was teaching uh, the other day for um, University of Virginia. Mm-hmm. And somebody asked me a question, and I said, well, it was actually at the University of Virginia that someone did a study a few years ago about, they just like put people in a room and, and told them you can't do anything, like you can't do a crossword puzzle or meditate formally if that's your habit, or you just have to sit and be with yourself. And it was like unbearable for a lot of people. And the only option other than just sitting and, and noticing what you were thinking and feeling uh you have the option of administering this mild electric shock to yourself. Yeah, right. And people, you know, and it's, I'd have to say, especially men, uh, chose the shock. The shock. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I kept thinking of that so many times during this last year and a few months, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, it's not easy for everybody. Not everybody has some sense of comfort and, and being okay with whatever arises in their experience. And, as you say, love for themselves, no matter what, and, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and people had to learn fast, you know, to yeah. do something. It's, um, and it's funny cause, um, I think those moments where you can kind of arrive into stillness with acceptance and you can kind of just, okay, let me, let me just be here. 
I feel like it does just open up the possibility for deeper interactions when you can cultivate that quality. And something that I've been going back to probably like the biggest, um, like the hardest part of the pandemic and also like the biggest lesson is just in accepting grief. Um, Mm -hmm. Because there there have just been, I mean, so many people have passed away so Mm -hmm. rapidly, like incredibly Mm -hmm. fast. And um, even within my own family, like I lost uh, two uncles and an aunt. Mm. And, um, and it's been really, you know, it's been hard, I think, uh, especially for my parents, you know, they were a lot closer with them. Yeah. And um, they were based back in Ecuador, but the pandemic really ravaged Ecuador. And so many people died early, you know, earlier than they, they had to, or, or you mm-hmm. know, whatever, however you want to look at it. But that grief, you know, the sadness, especially being there for my mother, because she lost her brother, who was Mm -hmm. her closest sibling. Um, She, you know, that like the, the tears of knowing that that relationship is it's, it's over, you know, like it's, it's, they can't have new moments together, but she does have all these beautiful memories. I think for all of us, it just like united the family in this really powerful way where it's like, okay, well, we need to love each other right now. Like, you know, not later. We need to like, if we have conflict, if we have issues, if we have, you know, things that we um, need to figure out so that we can have better harmony as a family collective, then let's talk about them like with more acceptance because we know how impermanent life is now. And in a way where, you know, it used to be so, so common and so easy to just like forget about the impermanence of life and just not consider death. But now that it's in your face for a lot of different families around the world, it's like, okay, well, This is a reality. Like, you know, even if you live for a hundred years, human life is just a speck of time. It's so fast. So what else can I do? Like, why would I, you know, why would I cause disharmony? Let me actually like align myself and try to have my actions support as much harmony as possible in all of the, you know, events that I'm a part of. That's really beautiful. And I'm sorry about your family. I, I sort of feel it. Uh, not with my biological family, but because I have so many close ties in India and it was mm-hmm. such an important place for me. And, and I don't think I know anybody who hasn't had a death, you know, right. that they've suffered. And, and I'm really fascinated by what you said about grief, because I think for a lot of people, um, certainly in this country, you know, we were not brought up with the skills to, handle that particular emotion very oh, yeah. well. And, and I think culturally it's, uh, it's something strange, you know, in, in our, in our upbringing. Like I can remember um, some years ago when someone sort of in my circle of people died and, and people around him started behaving very badly to one another. Wow. And it was, it was confusing. And then uh, someone who was a friend of mine said to me at that point, don't you understand? Nobody knows how to grieve. You know, they're all grieving. And and you do hear those stories a lot in contrast to your family where, you know, people uh, start fighting over the silverware or something they actually don't really care about, you know, Uh, but you know, they loved you more than they loved me or, you know, now there's no chance to say what I really should have said long ago or something like that. And, you know, things fall apart and it gets, get really, really ugly. So, you know, how beautiful that your family came to a very different place. Yeah. And it's been, um, it's been wonderful because, um, I think that, that, that wisdom from impermanence just runs so deep (laughs) and, Mm -hmm. and we know that as meditators, but, um, when, when it happens like in daily life, when you are, and also when you start understanding it at an intellectual level, I feel like it just opens up so much in terms of, like, how am I going to move through this moment? And also, how am I going to allow flexibility in my life so that I can weave and bob and, you know, just more easily move through the ups and downs of life without creating so much resistance? And I think in a lot of ways, like, I'm so grateful for even the conception of impermanence because it's like my best friend, you know, like I I study it when I'm meditating and I see it in my life and I realize that if I try to put walls up against impermanence, then I'm going to suffer. And, um, and I think that's just like the pandemic was like, Hey, like this whole, even to the way that we 
conceive of civilization. Like even this is impermanent, you know, like having the experience of going to the supermarkets in New York City, because my wife and I, we were living in New York City during the pandemic and up until um, August. And Mm -hmm. we, you know, going to the supermarkets and not seeing food there and, you know, things being like half empty. And it's like, okay, wait, so this civilization that we hold so precious is also impermanent, you know, Mm -hmm. like it's also not going to be hyper consistent the way we crave it to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's also such an interesting time in terms of your book to have a book that's focused on relationship in a way, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, (laughs) you know, because it was so disrupted and and maybe that did give us time to really look at uh, a much deeper level of what it means. Like here's an excerpt from your book where you write the attributes of a good relationship, selfless listening, calm communication, holding space for each other, strong trust, no need to control authenticity, no need to perform, rest, laughter, an adventure together. The love between you is empowering commitments to each other, are clear, flexible, no need to always be together. Both have the space to grow and change. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> it's, it was funny, Sharon, because um, when we, so my wife and I, my wife is also a really serious meditator um, in the Goenka tradition. And like, it feels like we've had two relationships together. Like there was a time period before we started meditating, which was incredibly chaotic. Mm-hmm. And then there was a time period after where like over time we were able to develop better understanding of ourselves and each other and develop new harmony. But um, the pandemic, it just like, it put everything that we had learned to the test. And it was like, you know, we were just, it was just the two of us, you know, alone. Yeah in this like little New York city apartment. And, um, it was, you know, challenging in ways, but I felt like not only did it give me the opportunity to fall in love with her again, but it, it just, you know, it showed us the ways where, especially in moments of potential conflict, where do I stand in this? Like, am I causing this? Am I making this harder and taking ownership of like what my perceptions and what my reactions are sort of pushing me to do? And that kind of, I don't know, it just helped the both of us a lot to, to just fall back on clear communication, you know, even after we meditate. And, and it's interesting because we, we, we do a style of meditation that's very focused on purification. So mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not like bliss-based where we're trying to like necessarily feel good all the time. We're actually just focusing on deeply purifying the mind. So sometimes you finish meditating and you do feel great. And other times you finish meditating and you're like, whoa something big came up. So staying in communication with each other about like where our mental state was at. And we let each other know, like, you know, and I, I, you know, feel a lot of like heaviness right now, or I don't feel great right now so that we could kind of position ourselves like in the day and try to figure out, okay, well, you know, she needs more support today or I need more support today. So, um, yeah, the communication just made that big shift and just being open and authentic about, hey, like, this is how I feel right now. And it actually has nothing to do with you. And it's not your fault, even even if my mind wants to figure out how it can be your fault. Well, I I know S.N. Goenka was your teacher. He was my first teacher. And, and that first um, exposure I had to meditation was really in the light of a purification model. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the great gifts it gave me was um, not only an allowance, but even a kind of um, respect for difficulty that I was going through. You know, yeah, like, yeah. it wasn't like a mistake or a, you know wrong road taken or or something. It was important, and especially because I was so young and um, was seeing a lot of my emotional landscape for the very first time, and it really wasn't that pretty. <laughs> it was pretty bad, you know. Yeah, and. And to ha- hold it in a light like, oh, this is an important part of the process. This is like being truthful. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't have to like super identify with this just because it's here right now. Uh, like, this is who I really am. This is how I'm always right. going to be angry, you know. Uh, and uh, it was like an amazing context for being able to bear difficult emotions. So now I'm thinking, well, I guess it extends to someone else's difficult emotions as well. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I love that. Um, the, even the idea of like the purification model, because 
it's it's even changed the way we speak to each other like my mm-hmm. wife and I when we especially when we communicate it's like it's no longer like I am angry it's like um anger has come up or like you know like anger has arisen and it's not so much like you own the anger but it's just something that's passing through you and it feels you know especially in the beginning when you do kind of get into pretty serious meditation that's you know purification focused where the purpose is for you to you know become freer and lighter and like live a happier life but there are going to be ups and downs through that and the downs do feel pretty um deep sometimes because like you're you're you know excavating these really profound patterns that are you know so tied to your suffering and you're finding a way to release them so that you don't contain them anymore but the balancer is really the equanimity um because when you start cultivating enough equanimity then it becomes much easier to just be like, oh, like, I don't feel okay right now, but that's also okay. You know, Mm -hmm. I actually feel I can be totally honest and acceptant of how I feel down, but at the same time, I don't fall into, like, letting it control me or, you know, letting it kind of just take over my actions. Um, So being able to just cultivate that space where, you can feel two things at once and you're just like, yeah, I don't feel good, but I'm also, I'm okay. Um, I think makes that, that whole purification model just like really, it works. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And I'm curious about what you'd say about the correlation between uh, the relationship we have to ourselves and how that extends to the relationship we have with others. Oh, it's huge. I mean, it's everything, you know, it's, it's, it just sets everything up. And I think in a lot of ways when, even even in terms of people, you know, when we have aspirations, when we have goals, when we want to improve our relationships with our parents, our friends, or, you know, our intimate partners, it all comes down to you, to whatever is happening inside of you. If If you're carrying a lot of hurt from the past, if you find that you're getting caught up in old patterns that are just kind of like forcing you to repeat the past over and over again, if you work on those, if you spend time like diligently and intentionally trying to, you know, let go of whatever it is you need to let go of to get to know yourself on a deeper level, to build the self-love that you need um, to have a happier life, then you're going to automatically see all of that reverberate outward, just like waves, just reverberate outward into all facets of your life. And there's this pretty interesting property that I think happens to a lot of meditators, even with among amongst different traditions where if you start meditating, you start undoing a lot of that really thick human habit, like all of this this fear, this craving, this aversion, and you start just opening up all of this real human nature, which is this like love, this compassion, this creativity, this you know new energy for life, this um, ability to be happy for others, like what in you know the the Buddha Dhamma what we call like the Brahma Viharas, mm-hmm. it just opens it all up so that we can just feel so much more love for ourselves and each other, but it really it begins with you. It's it's quite hard to change your relationships without changing yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also reflected in uh, one of the themes of of your writing, which is healing and trauma. Mm-hmm. And the impact of trauma comes up a fair amount in your writing, and uh, clearly is is a direct relationship to how we are with relationship, right? Yeah, and it's 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 funny um because there's there can be so much, you know, I think for a lot of people like the, even the idea of like entering healing um like any type of healing work it's like do I have to have you know did I have to have to go through some like really serious trauma to even enter into this world? The the answer is re- it's, it's not really, you know, there there are definitely a lot of people who've experienced extremely severe trauma and are benefiting from healing and benefiting from therapy, benefiting from different forms of meditation. But then you don't quite realize that all of us have had moments of strong emotion, like Mm -hmm. moments of very heavy reaction. And all of that gets imprinted into the mind. So Mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, live a happier life, if you want to like have more mental clarity, if you want to make better decisions during hard moments, then anybody can benefit from healing because all of us are carrying some degree of baggage from the past. And you don't necessarily have to have gone through such a huge trauma for you to realize like, oh, 
yeah, I can, you know, like live a better life and create better conditions for myself so that I can just like move about life with more ease and happiness. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the word I, um, well, the word that comes to my mind is not very exciting, so it's not a good word, but <laughs> you know, like, uh, what I think of trauma as has sometimes been described as being frozen, Oh, you yeah. know, we're stuck, we're frozen, some part of ourselves, some part of our response to life. And, um, and so the opposite of that would be something more flowing. And so the word that I tend to use is options, you know, then we have options yeah. where we didn't feel options. And I think, well, that's not a great word. It sounds a little cold, but you know, that's like um, another <laughs> way of saying it is creativity can happen. You know, yeah. it's like we're alive and, and, in that flow rather than uh, being enclosed and stuck. Uh, it's, it's so true, honestly. Like I, and personally in my life, like I had zero access to creativity until I started meditating. Like I, would, mm-hmm. I had never planned to be a writer. I had never written any poems. Like I, I w- never even conceived of writing as a possible like career or like life path that I would take until... I started meditating and I was a few courses in and I realized I was like, oh, there like there's this like m- like motivation coming from within me where I want to be creative. And it was so new and like I kind of like stumbled around it. Um, but it's funny seeing that with people who aren't necessarily artists, you know, whether you're like a doctor or a scientist, like um, or, you know, whatever architecture, whatever it is that you do like you can bring that creativity that emerges from a lighter mind into like any part of your life. And, and a lot of that just looks like those sort of daily moments where you do have a difficult situation and you can kind of slow down the pace in your mind and you can see, okay, this is how I would have behaved in the past, but actually this time I'm going to align myself with an action that better supports the person who I really believe myself to be and who I want to be tomorrow. Hmm. I'm very curious too about you know mostly we've been talking about relationships um, with mm-hmm. those whom we love anyway and and sort of loving in a better way. But what about the people we really don't care for all that much, you know, or or that we find extremely challenging? I mean, this has also been a time of a lot of polarization in this country and uh, very fraught feelings and family s- splintering and. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and and somehow trying to um, have a better relationship with people and yet not fall into a kind of moral um, bardo. I don't, know, I don't know the English word I would try to use. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, just some confused state or not even confused, but inability to have moral clarity at the same time as having uh, real care for somebody else. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult. Like it, it depends on our personal capacity. Um, so I think if, if an individual can, you know, cultivate a life, a life for themselves where they feel you know, like comfortable putting up boundaries that they need to be able to thrive, like comfortable saying no to people when they need to say no and are sort of, you know, maturing in that level, then you can give yourself that, you know, sort of like new task of like, okay, let me do that higher level work of actually having love for all beings, like whether they have caused harm, whether they have, you know, um, I don't know whether they've like been troublemakers in our lives or in the world or whoever it may be. But I really, you know, one thing that I love especially is like that idea of meta and having love for all beings having full love for yourself and how much it connects with the idea of prison abolition Mm -hmm. because when you think about that it's like okay even though people have caused harm like loving all beings does not mean that you let people harm you not at all you know Mm -hmm. you can quite skillfully move with love and take hard actions and still make sure that you stand your ground properly so that people don't roll over you Um, but at the same time, you also leave an opening for the fact that like, we're all incredibly imperfect. All oftentimes we're all very motivated by delusion and that delusion will then cause us to create harm. But then understanding that there is the opening for like 
for repair, for healing, for rejuvenation, for there to be some type of restoration so that someone who has caused harm could potentially become a better person in the future and no longer cause harm. Um, I think having that type of mindset where we try to create more like regenerative cultures um, is like key and is like, it's really, you know, loving kindness, like in action. Um, but I think it's big. I think if, you know, if you do have the capacity, like extend your love further, cause you'll actually find that the, the further that your love can go, the more beings that it can encompass, it's just a bigger sign of, of your own personal freedom. I think that's really beautiful. And it, it brings up the very complex topic of forgiveness and what it means. And I'm really uh, loving the fact that you brought it up in terms of kind of punishment, you know, and right. I remember talking to somebody once about a friend of his whom I had never met, but who had behaved badly, you know, quite badly, like maybe 10 years before. And uh, karma had sort of ensued so that he was just then suffering for what he had done before. And, and my understanding from other people was that in the ensuing 10 years, he had completely changed and right. he, he'd, he'd become really a, a different person and not causing that kind of harm. But when I was talking to his friend and uh, he said something about him and I said, well, what I'd heard was that he was really different. And, and the person I was talking to said, yeah, but his behavior was so bad. Uh, and I was, and I said, what else do you want him to do? You know, yeah. <laughs> but change, assuming the change is like sincere and real. And, and I said, when you think of people going to prison, do you think of punishment or do you think of rehabilitation? And I would bet anything is punishment. And I would bet anything when he thinks of himself in terms of mistakes he's made or uh, problems he's caused or ways he's acted unskillfully. I bet it's punishment there too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite tough, you know, especially in those moments where, you know, forgiveness would ease the situation and open the door to something new happening. Your perception will still be really attached to what happened before because mm -hmm. your perception just like it carries all of the memories of the past and you'll often kind of combat against that. It'll kind of be like a little bit of a wall that you have to like intentionally overcome so that you can take the moment in as something fresh as opposed to, you know, especially if you see someone who did something wrong to you and then automatically your perception is going to be like, oh, this person is so bad. And this is like um, an example that Koenka would give in his discourses. But you have no idea, like 10 years past, like this person could have become much worse or they could have become an angel. They could have become mm -hmm. a saint. And and that's the reality. And, and if you take that idea and place it within our personal, inter, you know, our relationships that we have with the friends and family members and all of that, if you really want to forgive, you need to be aware of your perception so that, you know, you may consciously want to give them a fair chance and start again. But you need to be aware that that, that perception of yours is going to try to get in the way. And when you see them, they, it may, you know, trigger that those old feelings and those old memories of the past. But then if they have applied enough change behavior, then what we need to do is try to surmount that barrier of perception so that we can accept them for who they are now, um, especially if the change behavior has become consistent. Yeah, and it is so complex because, first of all, forgiveness is not a, a coerced activity, you know? Yeah. It's like, you, you know, it, in no way should be aligned with force. It also needs to not be aligned with delusion, you know, mm -hmm. like um, maybe the person has gotten worse or maybe you need to really, uh, when you talk about boundaries, you know, what happens in your heart in terms of um, allowing the possibility of change and still taking care or being protective or having strong boundaries, that may be very smart. As one of my friends, my colleague, Sylvia Borstein would say, forgiveness does not mean amnesia. Oof, you know, it yeah. doesn't mean you're wiping the slate clean that nothing happened or it didn't matter. Maybe it still matters quite a lot. And, and we need to acknowledge all of that and the grief and the pain and the anger. And at the same time, uh, do we allow for even the possibility of change? Yeah. Um, and so for me, when I think about it, I, I mean, you know, it seems so important that it not be coerced, but at the same time, I, I think we can measure 
kind of the degree of inspiration we might have to uh, see what's possible for us by the amount of obsession we have. You know, if, if someone else's actions have really taken over our time and our energy, then that might be a signal, you know? Yeah. Like it's, there's um, it's funny. I've been thinking about how like in, in the inverse of that, like if, if you're the one who has, you know, done something yeah. that you totally regret and you feel so much guilt from it, um, guilt carries a lot of tension. And, and there's one thing where, okay, you can be motivated by guilt to become better, but there's no need um, to like carry on that internal punishment over and over again, where you're feeling this heaviness of guilt. And if you actually were to remove the tension from the guilt, you could just simply apply the lesson that you learned, like what your friend was saying, you know, there's, there's no need for amnesia, you're not going to erase the memories of the past. In fact, it's quite useful. The past is useful in the sense of understanding, okay, this is what happened. And actually, this is how I can move forward better. But there's no need to just punish yourself over and over again, because what happened happened. And the, the best form of forgiveness is like change behavior, like, let me show up in this life in this moment in a new way. And I'm gonna fully commit to not doing what I did again. Mm -hmm. That same friend, Sylvia, um, uh, when we would teach together, one of the saying she would use quite a lot uh, was everyone is just doing the best that they can. And I used to find it as a native New Yorker a little bit annoying. Frankly, <laughs> you know, I would think like, what? Come on. You know, they can do better for God's sake, you know? <laughs> and so can I. And, and uh, I was reading um, something one day and I, I came upon this saying of Maya Angelou's, and this is not exactly what she said, but it's the popularized form of what she said, which was basically, when you know better, you do better. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, oh, that's actually correct, isn't it? You know? Yeah, it's like, really true. It's because we're just not seeing. We're lost in delusion. We're lost in ignorance. We're lost in greed, hatred, or delusion, something like that, that we're acting in the way that we do. And when we see better, when we know better, we do better. That's really interesting. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, you know, I, I, what comes to mind is like, how do you like, what do you think about the relationship between healing and liberation? Because like you and I, you know, we, we kind of talk about both. But then mm -hmm. a lot of it is inspired by the Buddhist teaching. And um, like, I, it's just a topic that I've been thinking a lot, because I realized that I came into meditation, and found its usefulness through healing, but then mm -hmm by sort of deepening my understanding of what this meditation process was, it totally introduced me to this world of liberation. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I wonder how you conceive of that. I would say the same for me, you know, like uh, when I went to India, I was 18 years old. I'd had this very uh, traumatic, chaotic childhood. I um, was a, a junior in college at that point and uh, I'd never been in therapy. I'd never really done the introspection, which was why it was so horrifying. <laughs> to see my own mind, you know, <laughs> and why Goenka was so essential to my well-being because I would, you know, I'm somewhat famous for once having marched up to him and looking him in the eye and saying, I never used to be an angry person before I started meditating, thereby laying blame exactly where I felt it belonged, which was on him, you know, clearly it was his <laughs> fault that I was so angry. And of course, I've been hugely angry and I hadn't really seen it. And so uh, learning how to be with what I was feeling without so much judgment and uh, was really the beginning of a path of loving kindness for me. And, and it was very important, but the, um, the degree of pain that I was in meant that all of my early efforts were about me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that was inevitable and it was right. And, you know, so even though I was in India and I was in a context, a larger context of, you know, we practice, uh, out of dedication to the well being of all and, you know, loving kindness for all beings. I didn't really care about other beings that much, <laughs> if at all. And, you know, really, probably not at all. Uh, and it was only after a certain amount of time and greater growth and healing that I actually found uh, a real kind of acute compassion for others. Uh, mm. That was natural. It was just inevitable. And so the whole context of my wanting to practice and wanting to do more practice kept changing. And I also think, um, you know, as a Westerner 
and with a certain kind of conditioning and uh, maybe broader than that, but that's really what I can speak to. A lot of what exists in the um, context of practicing for liberation uh, takes a certain balance that we don't necessarily have Mm -hmm. in light of conditioning that we also may be experiencing. So, for example, even just like the word mindfulness, which would imply being with our experience without judgment, which would also mean without Mm self-condemnation. You know, whereas Goenka used to say all the time, be equanimous, be equanimous, Mm -hmm. be equanimous. It's not that easy, really. No, you have to cultivate it. You have to cultivate it. You know, like, it's really not easy to, like for me, looking at uh, that whole emotional world, of anger and grief and so on and not judging myself for it. That was like not really easy. And so, you know, that, that was a whole process which involved a lot of personal healing till I could come to the place where I actually could look at that whole big range of, of feelings and see them as impermanent and see them as conditioned and, Mm -hmm. um, and contingent upon other things, you know, not, not having independent kind of reified existence and so on. But it was only when I wasn't so like kind of rancorous about myself that I could get there. And so I, and I, I, you know, I always remember um, somebody, some journalists just asked me about this, which was very funny because it's a story that as these things happen, you know, actually was about me, but has entered the kind of annals of time and, you know, no one really quite knows what happened, but it was a time when I was at this very small conference with the Dalai Lama and in India, and I had a chance to ask him a question. And so this was, um, you know, maybe 1991, some, some year like that. And, uh, I said, your holiness, what do you think about self-hatred? And he said, what's that? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You know, which is not to deify Tibetan culture, but it's sort of like that rock bottom view of who we are. Right. Is different. Mm-hmm. And when you think about potential for growth and change in Buddha nature compared to how we tend to think of ourselves fundamentally. And so the best part of that conversation was when, um, like, his translators gathered around him, and some of whom were Westerners, and was trying to explain to him when we hear. <laughs> strive on with diligence. This is how we tend to take it. You know, when we hear, uh, give up all self-cherishing, which is, you know, famous Tibetan saying, this is how we tend to interpret it, which was a real eye opener for him, you know? And, uh, so there's a lot of work to be done to really be able to, I think, incorporate and use the teachings of liberation. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause it, it feels like, a like one, I, I definitely connect with um, with what you're saying because it's like a, a slow process that opens up and, you know, you you deal with a lot of these patterns and then the the lightness of mind can kind of re, like orient itself to mm-hmm. a higher trajectory. Um, and, and it's funny, even hearing about your story, it reminds me of I'm like my wife, like when she started meditating daily, she like her for her for first whole year she was like pretty angry mm-hmm. and she's she's like the sweetest person <laughs> and she was like why am i so mad like you know because it's just yeah. all this bundled up anger was just pouring out yeah. and she wasn't like taking it out on anyone or doing anything but she was just like whoa like this stuff is just passing through me and you know she's totally different now but it's it's um it's impressive how much we can sort of walk on top of this, like con- these concrete layers of conditioning that we're totally oblivious to, but are still like motivating our behaviors. Mm-hmm. Um, and it takes something pretty powerful, like a liberational tool to basically work like a jackhammer to just get through, <laughs> through mm-hmm. these layers. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's funny. Um, and I-, I have one more question. I was wondering, yeah. I saw this um, post that you put up um the other day on on instagram where it was like after many months of uh meta practice in burma who are you practicing with oh that was Saida upandita oh upandita nice yeah really cool which is also a very um 
kind of funny story in that we had brought him here to Barry to the Insight Meditation Society in 1984. Uh, and I did a three month retreat with him in mindfulness. And at some point I was having like a, uh, I was just having, you know, it's just like a painful interlude in my practice. And, mm-hmm. and I went to him because uh, we had a really good relationship. And I, I went to him and I said, I understand that there are certain ways of practice where you start out with something like loving kindness in depth. And then uh, when you get kind of more confident in it and you have a steadier concentration, uh, you can then watch the arising and fading away of qualities like peace and joy and bliss. And I said, I want to do that one. (laughs) You know, like this is enough. I don't want to watch these and of course, you know, difficult yeah. things anymore. And he laughed, you know, and was basically like, yeah, oh, maybe, you know. And then I went to Burma the next year and did three months. Yeah, it's, it's, um, that's really cool. It's funny because uh, that, that whole practice of meta, it, um, like it's, it's hard, you know, like, I mean, the, the way, the way our retreats are set up in the Goenka tradition, we, you know, we, we, we start with cultivating, um, you know, we take our, our vows of morality and then we, do a third of the retreat where it's just concentration building so that your mind can have focus Mm -hmm. to be able to do the insight work. And then we, you know, just spend like two thirds of the retreat, um, like meditating, purifying, you know, just going deep and trying to like undo all of these, um, these imprints that we have inside of us. And, but afterwards, you know, we end the retreat with meta and you can see the significant difference in like how clear you can generate meta you know, and it's, it's not, it's not like you doing it. You're just like connecting to meta. And, um, but the, the, the power of how like a purified mind can just generate so much more love. Yeah. And it's funny, like, you know, then you leave the retreat and you take that home and then, you know, you're not meditating as many hours as before and you're still doing your daily practice and you're still committed and, you know, continuing on the path, but you see the difference of that moment where it's like that sharp, you know, producing love from a very clear mind it's um it's a potent experience that's beautiful yeah well that was of course was the first time i ever heard of metta or loving kindness practice so before we Mm. and i both want to go back to your book and talk for just a couple of minutes about another one of my teachers this woman named deepama because she came up when we were first talking you know in the last podcast and somebody just contacted me um and said that they were doing a documentary on on Deepa Man. Really, said, really, you know, like that's super cool. It's really cool, and, and it's so great. And uh, she's so she's so famous in this like really interesting way. Like, honest, I think I mentioned this last time we were yeah. talking, but with all of my homies who are like in their like twenties and thirties who are really serious meditators, like we love her. Like, she's I'm so, so excited. <laughs> like, it's so great. I mean, it was that through the book about her that you- Yeah, I think um, you know, yeah, we like we have Goenka as our teacher, but then, you know, we all we all read a ton and um I don't know who it was that found that little book, but all of us had all these, you know, kind of experiences after like reading her just like kind of wow. yeah. feeling her presence and her love and just being inspired by her story and how real it was and how hard it was and yeah. talk yeah. about grief, like, you know, like yeah. how you can come back from that and not just come back from that, but like take this like leap in your evolution um, that just, I don't know, even like the story of um, her and her daughter and how she was like, I want to give my daughter the priceless gift, you know, and like help her like get established on the path, make progress on the path so that she doesn't need to really, you know, worry about her future. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just so, so inspiring. That's so great. Now, I'm really, you know, I'm just filled with joy at that thought. So there's so much inspiration in your book. So um, I thought I would read this list for everyone to take with them and then ask you uh, to lead us in a reflection. So here's the list. In an era of uncertainty and unpredictability, these qualities will make life easier. A strong determination, a willingness to keep growing, the patience to listen to your intuition, the ability to adapt to unexpected changes, knowledge of what strengthens your inner peace, knowledge of your values, and the ability to stick to them. 
So thank you for all your work, truly. And uh, would you lead us in, in some kind of reflection to close? Yeah, thank you. Um, there's one thing that I think um, definitely happens to me and I've seen happen to a lot of others. But when we get really deeply immersed in our personal healing or liberation work, um, the mind becomes like a microscope. And we see all of our conditioning. We see like the ups and downs and what we talked about before, like the mind seems very rough. Um, so in those moments, it's pretty easy to kind of feel like you're not making progress. So one thing that I've found really helpful is that especially if you're just like committed to your growth, like make sure that you occasionally take a very big intentional step back so that you can take a look at the bigger picture um, and take notice of where you were and how you were when you started this work and where you are now and how you've changed. And then let that difference inspire you to continue doing that work so that you can keep making those leaps forward for yourself um, in the future and you can continue blossoming, but just take note of that difference between where you started, where you are now and where you will be. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. And to learn more about Diego's work, you can visit www.yungpueblo, it's Y-U-N-G-P-U-E-B-L-O.com. And you can find a copy of his new book, Clarity and Connection, in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats wherever books are sold. Thank you to all who are listening. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. May you be safe, may you be healthy, may you be happy, and may you live with ease. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.